You are listening to Living with ADHD and CPTSD, available on Apple Podcasts and other platforms everywhere. Everybody and welcome to another episode of Living with ADHD and CPTSD. I am Russ, your host, and today's episode to do with ADHD is on executive function, or as I will call it today, executive dysfunction. Basically, executive function is self-regulation, which is essential for self-control. And self-control the definition is anything you do to yourself, you're trying to modify your own behavior, trying to change the future to create a, or for a delayed outcome. And this is something that a lot of us, or I guess you could say most of us with ADHD suffer from, which is an inability to self-regulate and have self-control when it comes to behaviors and remembering what we need to do, um, so I'm going to give you a lot of my own, um, situations and personal examples, but I'm also going to explain exactly what executive function is. Now, I, let's see the best person today that has really explained and really made me understand exactly what executive function is when it comes to ADHD is psychologist, excuse me, psychologist Dr. Russell Barkley, who has done a lot of work regards to ADHD. Um, one of his theories he has worked on is executive function. And after listening to his video on YouTube, which I definitely would recommend going to watch and listen to, and I recommend listening to it a number of times in order to truly get a good grasp on this video and on the topic. He explains so many different things regarding executive function, and it is really important because it'll help you as it helped me understand exactly what my disabilities and the problems that I'm having with executive function in my daily life. So there are seven abilities to manage with this like executive function. Um, delayed rewards are the important rewards, right? So they have self-awareness, redirect attention system on them on themselves. There's self-restraint, executive inhibition, and then there's non-verbal working memory. What are you doing to yourself? Uh, we can replay past images of our past to ourselves. Now, I'll give you a bit of a brief uh, how things develop in a human when they're born and up to the point when they become an adult. And then I will explain exactly what happens with us and the reasoning that we have so many problems with working memory and self-control and remembering our, our past and allowing it to work into our future. So um, there's basically three systems that de develop, which take about a decade. Um, just so you know, Humans can provoke their own emotions, which is a unique thing to human beings. Um, images have emotions that are welded onto them, and you have to manage your emotions because they'll drive others away. One thing that has been said for a long time that he is very adamant on is that people who have ADHD do not have a lot of friends and have a tendency to drive away friends because they have a hard time managing emotions and you know like saying things planning um keeping a memory of what you're doing um like it's pretty straightforward to be honest so you can manage your emotions speak uh, and then you can manage your motivations and humans can replace external consequences with mental representations and can motivate themselves. Uh, there's planning and problem solving involved in that. Um, now, when children play, it is a preparation for problem solving. So it's like a, let's see what happens. And 
there's a mental problem solver internalized play that are as an adult taking apart and recombining images and words in your mind to solve problems now by 30 years old, the average time horizon for a person that when they're thinking about the future is eight to 12 weeks. Uh, children, obviously when they're born and when they get to a certain age, like three to five, their th time horizon is basically today. It's very limited. So they only think about today, today, today. They don't think about tomorrow. They don't think about what's gonna happen in their life in a week or in a year. So this, if you think about it, this explains and explain, well, yeah, explains why to a child, time seems to take forever because they can only think about the now. They can't think about and plan weeks and weeks ahead. And of course, as an adult, as you know, we're someone who thinks about our our future we plan out our days we plan out our weeks our months we make vacation plans like months ahead or even a year ahead whereas a child is not capable of doing that because they only think in the now and it's one of those things that if you have children you can definitely see for yourself it's very obvious and as they get older their mind begins to change right so you just have to kind of observe when you're when you're watching them and you'll see it for yourself now executive function is judged by the strength of seven skills self-awareness which is self-directed attention inhibition also known as self-restraint Nonverbal working memory, the ability to hold things in your mind, essentially visual imagery and how well you can picture things mentally. Verbal working memory, self-speech or internal speech. Most people think of this as their inner monologue or inner voice. And there's emotional self-regulation, which is the ability to take the previous four executive functions and use them to manipulate your own emotional state. Uh, this means learning to use words, images, and your own self-awareness to process and alter how we feel about things. Then there's self-motivation, how well you can motivate yourself to complete a task when there is no immediate external consequence. And finally, planning and problem solving. Uh, a lot of experts sometimes like to think of this as self-play, how we play with information in our minds to come up with new ways of doing something. By taking things apart and recombining them in different ways, we're planning solutions to our problems. And does this, like to you, does this sound familiar? Um, anyone who exhibits the classic symptoms of ADHD will have difficulty with all or most of these seven executive functions. Uh, like problems with inhibition in someone with ADHD leads to impulsive actions. Uh, for example, yeah, and then problems with emotional regulation will lead to inappropriate outbursts. So essentially, if you really think about it, ADHD is an executive function deficit disorder or EFDD. Uh, the umbrella term ADHD is simply another way of referring to these issues. The seven executive functions develop over time in generally chronological order. So self-awareness will begin to develop around age two. And then by age 30, planning and problem solving should be fully developed in a neurotypical person. Those with ADHD are generally about 30 to 40% behind their peers and transitioning from one executive function to the next. Therefore, it does make sense for children and adults with ADHD to have trouble dealing with age appropriate situations. They're thinking and acting in ways like that are much like younger people. So awareness of these executive functions can help parents set up an early detection system for ADHD, helping them to seek professional evaluation and accommodations before a child begins to struggle in school. Then with proper accommodations and treatment, people with ADHD can basically learn to use what they know and strengthen these executive functions over time. Okay, so how the brain is wired when it comes to executive function and the ADHD brain here, um, there's basically four circuits that are developed. There is the what circuit, the when circuit, the why circuit, the who circuit. So the what circuit goes from the frontal lobe. 
especially the outer surface, back into an area of the brain called the basal ganglia, particularly a structure called the striatum, or striatum, excuse me. The what circuit is linked to working memory. So it's in this circuit that we think starts to guide what we do. This is particularly true when it comes to plans, goals, and the future. The when circuit, this second circuit goes from the same prefrontal area back into the very ancient part of the brain called the cerebellum, at the very backmost part of your head. The when circuit is then the timing circuit of the brain. It coordinates not just how smooth behavior will be and the, con and the sequence of behavior, but also the timeliness of your actions and when you do certain things. An improper functioning when circuit in a person with ADHD explains why we often have problems with time management. So I'm sure you know what that means. We often think that we're capable of knowing how long it's going to take to do something, being good at planning out uh, sequences or, ta or tasks, or if we're doing multiple things during a day, we have we often do have a lot of problems with managing this time frame, and then we end up falling behind in one particular task, realizing that we don't have any time left now, and then having to jump ahead to the next one. So it's very difficult. And a good example of that is doing work where you have to deal with multiple clients and multiple projects at a single time. Okay, so the Y circuit, uh, this is the third circuit also sorry the third circuit also originates from the frontal lobe going through the central part of the brain which is known as the anterior cingulate to the amygdala the gateway to the limbic symptom system excuse me it's often referred to as the hot circuit because it's linked to our emotions this is where we what we think controls how we feel and vice versa it's the final decision maker in all our plans when thinking about multiple things we could be doing this is the circuit that eventually chooses among the options based on how we feel about them and their emotional and motivational properties. So the final circuit is the who circuit, like I said. This final circuit goes from the frontal lobe to the very back of the hemisphere. It's where self-awareness takes place and where we're aware of what we do, how we feel, both internally and externally, and what's happening to us. So by viewing ADHD in relation to these four circuits, you can understand where the symptoms can originate from. Depending upon which circuits are most impaired and least impaired, then you can see variations in the kinds of symptoms that an individual is going to have. So some people have more working memory deficit, like myself. Um, that's one of my major problems. And then there are some people who have more emotion regulation problems, although I do have a problem with that too. So both are pretty pretty rough for me. I don't know about you guys, but that's my situation. Um, and then there are some people who have more difficulties with timing and then less difficulties with all the, the other ones. But the, all of them involve these circuits. So think of it this way, okay? When we're having problems with remembering things, uh, planning out our day, planning in the moment, um, doing multiple things at once, we have a hard time internally doing this. So a lot of people online, like experts and people who have experience with ADHD personally, and also like um, uh, partners or family members of people who suffer from ADHD, a lot of them recommend to make the mental information that you require physical. So basically externalizing the information because your working memory is shot or doesn't work properly. So we need cues, signs, charts, reminders, uh, to-do lists, um, put stuff in a visual field to remind you of what needs to be done right here, right now in the external. So, you know, you can make time real physical, like through clocks, timers, counters, watch minders. Uh, you basically put the time outside of you so that you can see it passing and judge your performance. You have no clock inside to put one in your, so put one in your visual field. Um, take lengthy assignments in small quotas, uh, a little bit of work over time to get you to your finishing goal. Um, we also cannot handle delays and get rid of the delays. So, sorry, so we get rid of the delays. 
bring it back into the now break all long-term projects into baby steps and we also need to make motivation external because we cannot create internal motivation and they are dependent on the environment for their motivation so we must put the consequences in the now or it won't work for us external continuous reinforcement create the motivation and it ha there has to be a consequence or the tasks or the job that you're working on will not get done so you do the problem manually and externally don't do it in your mind and now the other things that you need to do is you need to refuel that energy tank like and i don't like i mean like kind of like a motivational tank in a way so if you use rewards and positive emotions the use of self statements of effectiveness does help boost motivation for someone with adhd they do say that you should take breaks. So like a 10 minute breaks frequently and then some relaxation and meditation while you're having that break, or having that break allows the fuel tank to restore so that in a later after you can continue working and being successful with what you're doing. And then you need to help visualization of the rewards. And another important thing is physical exercise. Now, one thing that I have learned in the past and unfortunately did forget, but was I also learned it again, is for people who are working uh, constantly and have ADHD, in order to stay on top of things and to be at your top potential or your peak ability mentally, they do recommend that you can do something like sip on a sports drink or a lemonade, um, because the, the blood glucose in the front lobe, if it starts to go down, it does affect your ability to be at your peak performance or at the top of your abilities. Um, despite what a lot of experts say out there, sugar doesn't hurt people with ADHD. Like, a, But here's the thing, they're not saying take a Gatorade or a sport drink and drink it like like all at once, right? Like within a minute like you know how you see on the on the commercials of the athletes who have been doing their workout and they and, or they're finishing their game and they go and grab the sports drink and then you see them put their head back and they're drinking it well they don't want you to do that they don't want you to gulp it all down they want you to take little sips at a time over the day because they want you to maintain the blood glucose level not like load yourself with sugar so that you're like going crazy right because despite the fact that ADHD, you know, you're, you're going to be going heavy. You're going to be going real fast. It can, if you do way too much at once, it can be like a sugar high. And then of course, as a lot of us probably already know, is that when you burn off that sugar, you get a, like a sugar burn or you drop. So then you start to have worse performance. So it is important to keep the blood glucose levels up, but don't go crazy on the drinks. That drink should last you for the entire day. That is the key with this. Okay, I'm going to take a quick break here. And then when I get back, I'm going to talk about something that is very common with a lot of us. And that is called time blindness. All right, everybody. Talk to you soon. All right, everybody, welcome back. Okay, so we're gonna talk about time blindness now. Um, time blindness is a term coined by doctors who treat people with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD. Uh, adults typically develop an innate awareness of time and an ability to track its passing. Some people have what is called a harder or sharper time awareness. They know when they've been out for lunch too long or when something hasn't been in the oven for long enough. Uh, others have a much softer one. They can miss appointments and trains or play a game for hours and not realize they haven't eaten dinner. And at the severe end of the spectrum towards the soft end is time blindness, which can profoundly impact someone's life if they can't even ever keep deadlines or make social events. People with ADHD are often more time blind than others. And one of our top individual time awarenesses 
context plays a role. Sleep deprivation, anxiety, depression, being drunk, anything that might impact how we process the world can make us feel more time blind. And context has wildly changed for all us all at this moment in history. Without the usual time marker cues we might use to divide up our days, the school bus arriving, standing on a, on a crowded train platform, the line at the coffee shop, weekend nights spent at a restaurants with friends, we're swimming in a sea of sameness. It's like driving through a haze where there are just not as many distinct landmarks. Even if before all this, you might have called yourself a stickler for time, you're likely having a hard time sticking. You're throwing darts into a vicious slippery time jelly. That's actually kind of funny. Um, grief is one of the biggest causes of time blindness. Um, you know, holding on to time is, is a skill basically. And when we're, as I'm sure a lot of us have lost someone that we love, a grandparent, a parent, maybe a relative or a friend. And we do often tend to not be aware that time is passing. So another word or name for time blindness is also called time agnosia. Uh, we're trying to learn to cope with it. So most people with ADHD do have some amount of time agnosia or time blindness, which means that we don't have naturally, we don't naturally have a strong feeling for the passage of time. And at some points, such as when we're hyper-focusing, time moves much faster than we expect. At other times, such as when we're uninterested in what we're doing, it moves much slower. And this disconnect between how much time we feel has passed and how much time has actually passed impacts other aspects of ADHD, including our ability to plan, estimate the length of tasks, or be on time. That's one of the major f dysfunctions of executive function. So considering that planning, estimating time and sticking to a schedule are required skills for everything from cooking, you know, like we have to be aware that we're when we're cooking food that we have to keep a keep an eye on it, right? Cuz otherwise if we suddenly get caught up in something, like let's say we're watching a TV show and I know I've done this where I put the pasta on the the burner and I eat you know, the water is boiling you put in the pasta and you stir it a bit and then you know that it takes oh i don't know 12 minutes 15 minutes to make pasta i don't know how, how long it takes you guys maybe it's different for you but then you get caught up in a tv show and you sit down and you're watching and you're watching and you and your brain forgets that you're cooking pasta and then before you know it you start smelling something burning and you're going what's that smell <laughs> right and you're going and you go oh shit and you run to the kitchen and you notice that the, the water has boiled away and now you've just got pasta that's burned to the bottom of the pan or, or the pot and you're going oh no this is one of the examples of time blindness it's very common and I'm sure most of us who have made pasta or rice or something else that requires to be in a pot with water boiling have forgotten that we are cooking and we ruin a perfectly good container of pasta or craft dinner or um, you know like whatever else but anyways that's a, that's an example of time blindness and it, it is very difficult. So unless you create a timer, it's next to impossible a lot of times to constantly remember. Unless you're walking back and forth in the kitchen to the living room and you're doing a mental uh, active purpose of, of trying to keep an eye on things. If you sit down and you forget, you're, you're likely going to burn your food and that's definitely not a good thing. There are some strategies that you can use to help when it comes to time blindness or time agnosia. Uh, obviously, some of the big ones are watches and clocks, like, you know, I have a clock in front of you as you're doing it. Um, it seems to work better for people with ADHD. Uh, they seem to have a better develop, uh, seem to better develop the feeling of time passing. But folks with 
dyscalculia, which regularly co -occur occurs with ADHD, uh, can struggle more than most with reading at an analog clock, which is kind of an unusual thing, but I guess it is one of those uh, disabilities. Um, and so the tics could be distracting or abrasive to, to the hearing or to, you know, physical uh, against you. So another way, uh, very popular, and obviously setting a timer. Now, this is what I do. Whenever I'm cooking and I'm making food, like I'm going to later on this evening, is having a timer. So you can have a timer on your watch, of course, if you happen to be someone who has uh, an Alexa or a Google Home, then you can have the timer play out in front of you as you're doing the time, or if you happen to go and sit down, the timer basically prevents you from forgetting. And that gives you a nice quick reminder. Uh, repeating timers is also a good way because I know a lot of us when we go to bed and we wake up in the morning with an alarm clock, if we don't have a snooze button or like, you know, only alarms that go off once, especially if you haven't had exactly a great night of sleep, there is a good chance, and I've done it myself, where you f fall back asleep and there is no second alarm or timer to go back, to go off again, to re-remind you that it's time to get up. So some people, when it does not come to going to bed though, do have repeating timers. So that when you're doing tasks, like if you're doing a work task and you need to make sure that you move from project to project or from step to step and you only need to, you can only have so much time you can set in your phone to have a multiple timer or repeating timer where every we'll say 20 minutes for example the alarm will go off to to tell you that it's time to move on this is a big important thing that can be really helpful now if this is something that i like um music playlists television um if you get into a habit of using like a song uh, or a, uh, like a group of songs in, the, in a playlist or a television show to help be like a timer, this is a good strategy. But I definitely don't recommend doing it with a movie, uh, an hour long show, uh, a nice 22 minute show like most of our sitcoms and short drama, dramatic shows is a good timer. Um, if you set it up where when a song ends is when you move on or when you go and take care of that task that you've been working on, that's also really good. Another thing, uh, calendar apps are a good way because then you can get visual planning. Um, you get reminders on that day. Like if you have a, an appointment that you have to go to or there's a task that you have to accomplish on a specific day and at a specific time, you can actually set that timer uh, on in the, sorry, in the calendar day to go off at two o'clock on November 20th to say, do this. Uh, you have your appointment to go to the doctor. So it helps you remember. Uh, without that, you're likely going to forget and then you're never going to be able to get to your appointment on time. One thing is certain, you need to have multiple strategies in order to accomplish and to overcome this disability, this time blindness that we a lot of us deal with. You can't always rely on the same thing over time because with anything else, our minds do get used to something. So you need to switch it up occasionally in order to make it work. If you don't, that sixth time that that alarm goes off or you use that timer, there's a much better chance that you're really not going to react to it properly and may just end up ignoring it. And then you're going to be having some consequences that you aren't really prepared for. Another issue that really does come up is deferred gratification. Um, that is definitely very difficult to deal with, especially for myself. If we don't get gratification immediately after we've done something like a task or uh, we've done a favor or a chore for someone, if no nothing comes from it, there's a good chance that it will cause problems because 
I know for a fact that if if I'm not getting gratification, and this doesn't mean being being told, oh, good job, you did a great job, good for you, congratulations. Like, not necessarily that. That is that is big, but there's also things like, let's say, and this has happened to me. Like, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. I have had times where I have asked a question or I'm requiring um, a resolution to an issue and I have a, and my question is the key, the answer to the question is the key to the resolution. And my girlfriend has said to me that she doesn't have time to talk right now or would like to talk about it later during the day or another day. I know that it's extremely difficult for me to say, sure, no problem, we can do it later. One, I know I'm going to forget. Two, there's a good chance that I'm not going to put it down to remind myself or remind her to talk about it later. And the emotional stimulus and the attachment to it is going to be a lot less important down the road, whether it's on, you know half a day later, hours from now, uh, a week later. It doesn't work the same way. And I know that I feel anxious and I feel like I can't wait. You know, you get that built up feeling in your in your chest and you're just like, no, I want to get it done now. I don't want to wait. Right. I have done that. And it's extremely frustrating because with us, you want to have all the information right away. Right. You don't want to wait. Who who out there really wants to wait for to get your answer, to get your result? It is difficult. It's kind of like when we were a kid and Christmas was, you know, the, the beginning of December, right? I remember when I was a kid, I could hardly wait. It felt like Christmas takes would take forever to get here. And because of the fact that in a normal child, because our brains can't think beyond a certain time period, it does literally feel like Christmas takes forever. And as a normal person grows up and we can become an adult and our brain fully develops and our sense of time and sense of um, the ability to think ahead uh, gets better and fully develops, then as I'm sure, well, maybe some of you might not know this or experience this, but when you get to be an adult, Christmas comes and goes. It's here before you know it. And I know that is my thing. Like I notice that Christmas, like December 1st hits and the tree goes up and the lights go on. And I swear it feels literally like two days later, it's December 25th. You're opening your gifts and you're having dinner and that's it. And you're thinking to yourself, holy crap, where did the time go? But for a lot of people that deferred gratification was basically what that is. It's like, Remember your parents telling you, is you got to, you, Christmas is four weeks away. You got to be a good boy or else you're not going to get gifts from Santa Claus. So that deferred gratification, it really makes it difficult. So that's, that's the best example I can think of when it comes to deferred gratification. Knowing that you have to wait 25 days for Christmas to be able to get under that tree and open up your gifts. And that, great feeling of joy and happiness from receiving the gifts and for some people giving gifts right like i i have i have a hard time waiting and i get really excited in the anticipation of people opening my gifts and seeing the smiles on their faces and the joy inside is harder than actually opening my own gifts because i get a better set i get more satisfaction out of watching people open them rather than me opening my own gifts it's yeah it's tough um so yeah like it is definitely something that is really hard for people with adhd i know that a lot of us want it now we want our results we want to know about things now um the fact that our brains aren't fully developed and have dis like disadvantages like you know i think it's time for a break so when i come back we'll talk more about my own personal experiences with executive function problems okay talk to you soon
Okay, and we're back. So, here's the thing that I know just before I talk about my own personal experiences, there's one more thing I do want to say. ADHD basically splits apart the knowing and the doing. You can know stuff, but you won't do stuff. It's a disorder of the when and the where, not the what and the how. Your problem is not knowing what to do, it is with doing what you know. Interventions must be out at the place in your environment where you're not doing what you know to help you show what you know, to basically create a scaffolding around you to help you to do it. So basically like there, you know it in your mind, but to physically show it verbally and like, if you're using your hands or you're building it, it's difficult because you don't know how. So they need to, you need to use basically like external reminders. So, and I have talked about this in the past in other episodes, but external reminders like notes, obviously, and reminders, things that will help you visualize it so if you can visually see ahead of you and where you are it's going to make things a lot easier to do you can always try to teach someone with ADHD what to do but good luck it's not even going to leave the office they're not stupid so we aren't stupid we do know what to do and they know what you're telling them to do but we're not going to do it The info has no controlling value over their life. So what you need to do is you need to basically re-engineer the environment around them to help show them what they know. And the problem with what's happening is that with the delay to the consequence, all important social consequences are delayed consequences in time. You got to make yourself more accountable more often. And basically it's a chronic disorder right and ADHD must be managed every day in order to prevent the secondary harms it's going to cause okay now because I am very new to living with someone and especially in a relationship the like the difficulties in remembering a lot of different situations. Um, I guess the best example is planning ahead. So when I wake up in the morning, I like to get up, make a coffee, feed the dog, um, go and sit and just kind of chill out for about 30, 40 minutes before work. And when work starts, a lot of times the focus is so stuck on one thing like the work that there is a lot of extra stuff in the background for the future for the rest of like at the end of the day right so excuse me I know that there's going to be a dinner that I have to walk the dog that I have to clean I have to prepare, you know, there's, there's little things that have to be done over the course of the day and into the evening so you can function, you can survive, and then you'll be prepared for the next day. And my problem is, is that when I get home from work, my mind doesn't automatically go, okay, what's, what's for dinner? My mind is so like, uninterested or not in the time like in present time that all I really feel like doing is sitting down in the chair turning the tv on maybe grabbing a snack or a drink and just sitting there and do nothing and more often than not in the past when I was living on my own that was acceptable and I if I were really tired that evening I would just have a nap but now you know, with living with somebody, it's very different. You have to think about what, not just for yourself, but you have to think about for someone else at the same time. So my ability to think ahead and think to the future 
even like the next few hours is very difficult. I could sit here, for example, and record my podcast and do all the work and all the final parts, you know, to make it sound and look or sound and, and feel professional to you, the audience. But I could easily get all caught up in this podcast and not realize that it's 630 and dinner won't get done. Like if it's my night to cook, I need to be aware and realizing that it's my turn to make dinner, to have it ready before she has her break during working hours. She just happens to work at a different time than I do. So it's my responsibility some of the nights during the week to have dinner prepared so that she can eat before she goes back to work. Or, you know, when she's finished for the evening, she can eat instead of being hungry. So I have to take care and and basically have things set up a certain way so that when the time comes, like, 5 30 in the afternoon to go okay time is it's time to go get cooking so i have a reminder on my phone i have like an external reminder like a sticky note saying uh dinner is at 5 30 or sorry dinner is prepared at 5 30 so if i don't have any of that there's a really really good chance i'm not going to remember and it's going to get me in trouble and I'm not going to be able to be a proper a member of society and a proper member of this household. So that's where, like I said, the reminders come in. So I have a timer. <coughs> Excuse me. I have an alarm. I've got external reminder, sticky notes. Uh, there's it's verbal reminders throughout the day reminding me that I have to make dinner at 530. But it's so easy without those reminders to be completely lost in time and be late. It has happened before where I've been doing something that I'm so invested in and I enjoy so much that time slips by so fast and I have suddenly gone, oh damn, it's 30 minutes before her break and supper has barely got started. So I'm out there and this is where the problem really begins is because the fact that I realize that I'm behind, then the rest of my problems begin. I'm rushing. I'm not thinking properly. I don't have stuff sorted out and I do a lot of things that aren't correct. So I make plenty of mistakes. I wreck the food or it's not properly set up or it's late or I'm letting it cool too long because I didn't do it in the right time and in the correct order. It's it's something that I unfortunately have done on a regular basis. And the fact that I have to do this so often in compared to the past, it's a very difficult thing to master. And when you have ADHD, it's so easy for you to get lost in the reality of the world. And the one and the other thing that I'm realizing and it's, it's still something that I have to work on and to remind myself uh, every day and even in an hourly basis sometimes is the reality of this is it's not going to necessarily get better. You don't get cured. Like you're not going to outgrow ADHD. There's not going to be some miracle drug that you're going to take where it will fix your brain or re grow the connections or you know like catch up 10 15 years of catching up on growth in your frontal lobe this isn't going to happen now you can take medication you can do all the things that are important like proper diet take supplements exercise um, take drink plenty of water do meditation all these things can help make it a little easier but if you don't take the proper you know external help to make this easier like the reminders you know whether it's a phone alarm a timer uh, sticky notes you could make routines like you can you can definitely build a routine a lot of people i know out there are so reliant on on their routine that's how they get through the day and that's the other half of that is that if your routine gets broken whether it's due to changes in your life 
or you have a bad day or something goes terribly wrong and everything gets thrown off by, well, half hour, an hour or so, you can totally be a mess. So you're basically done for. And like I know I used to do when things would go wrong is instead of say, instead of sticking to the plan where I would make dinner, and this is on my own, keep in mind, I would just give up. I would I wouldn't even try. I would go and order like McDonald's or some fast food and that would be my dinner. So I wouldn't even try cuz there wasn't any point, right? Because I'm already heightened. I'm already on high alert. I'm not in a calm position. I'm not, you know, I'm not capable of doing any of these things properly because the fact that I everything got shot is just not helpful. So my working memory is so poor that without those external reminders or a plan ahead of time, I'm pretty much useless. And if I want to be a proper member of this household, I need to adapt. I need to, to you need to take your own take ownership of your situation. You can't sit back and blame others or blame the condition. Like I'm not saying that it's that it's bad that you know it's it's there it's not your fault. Well, of course it's not your fault obviously. And but it's not the world's fault. It's not your girlfriend or your boyfriend's fault or your partner's fault. It's not your family's fault. It's not that cab driver who got lost. It's not the train that was behind or the traffic. It's not their fault. You have to take responsibility for yourself. So if you know that you have a habit of forgetting things or you lose track of time and you can't think of the future like four hours from now and plan ahead and you're only in today or in the now mode, you need to take responsibility for your life. So basically make notes, write it out. Put it on this on your like on the fridge. Put it next to the stove. Have the details. Have the plans. Have it say, "This is when dinner is going to begin. This is how what I cook first. This is how long it's going to take. This is the ingredients that I'm going to use. This is what it's going to require." Blah blah blah. And then you got to have reminders on your phone telling you to remember to do this. You know. If, if dinner is for six o'clock and you know it's going to take about 40 minutes to prepare, you need to have that reminder at, let's say, 515 so that you've got a few minutes to get out to the kitchen, grab your stuff, put it out and prepare. You can have external reminders on the fridge. You can put uh, external reminders in the rooms that you're sitting in. You can put them on your desk. Like I've, I have one here that I created a few days ago. This is, this is on my desk. This is motivational, and this is to keep me positive. It says, be, in colon, real, honest, authentic, caring, and you. And then it says, now enjoy. You have to be able to properly adjust your life. You have to adapt. You have to have outside sources whether it's a person or your own changes that you make in your life, you need these things in order to make your life workable. Because ADHD, as we all know, really makes life extremely difficult and it makes it hard to live and it's hard to be like uh, workable with other people. Because imagine if you're living with two people and you're the only one who has this disability. The other two are neurotypical. They have a good working memory. They don't forget things. They're well organized, well planned. They talk to each other without any sort of problems. And you're that one who always seems to forget, always needs to be reminded, is not exactly the smoothest person when it comes to having discussions and conversations. And you might be shy, you might be easily aggravated, uh, highly anxious, you know, different different symptoms that can come up from ADHD. If you don't own up to the fact that you have this disability and you rely on everybody else to help you out, you're going to soon be alone. 
And it's not because they don't like you. It's because you're not reliable. And being with emotional, like the a topic I'm going to talk about on another episode, emotional regulation, that is something that really affects relationships, not just you know, like significant others, but friendships, work, family relationships. If, if you're unable to manage and keep your emotions in control and keep in check, that can have a very horrible side effect on your ability to be social and have friends and relationships and not feel like life is just meaningless. I have done a lot of work. When I first discovered that I had ADHD, it was very difficult in my relationship to go day by day. Fortunately, and it also can be unfortunate if you want to look at it, only seeing my girlfriend a couple days a week had its good and bad sides. And I didn't have to think about what I was doing for both of us every day. I only had to prepare for the Friday, you know, when I visited, and then I had to make sure that I was doing what I had to do that day to get through to avoid um, complications, uh, arguments, fights, uh, making her extremely frustrated. And then on, the, on top of it, because of my CPTSD, my child parts would come up and instead of being the adult and say and taking ownership and saying, yeah, I'm having a problem, I'm not doing well today, uh, or I need some time to rest or to, to zone out, I would be aggravated, I'd be triggered, and the adult would be nowhere to be found, and all there would be is child parts fighting and saying stupid things and and not being able to take care of myself. She, it, it would get to the point where she was very frustrated and felt like she was the only adult in the relationship. And as she likes to put it, it was like taking care of a giant toddler because I was so unreliable and couldn't do anything on my for myself that she had to take care of both of us. And until I was able to own up to that, the ADHD side was never going to get looked after. And once I was able to finally get a, a better grasp on the whole concept of the child parts coming on and getting triggered in my CPTSD, all those symptoms and those issues that ADHD was creating could never be looked at. And, and I was getting nowhere. There was no improvement. I wasn't able to own the situation. I wasn't able to realize that I had to do work and I had to make changes in my lifestyle, <coughs> excuse me, and add external uh, environmental changes to improve the quality of my life and the ability to be successful and be consistent in this. So you really need to make an effort to change the way you live your life. I know it's difficult. It's never going to be easy at the beginning because you're so used to things, especially if you're like me and you have built-in routines that you've had for years and years and years. Changing it isn't going to be something you can just do on a snap of a finger, right? It takes some time, but you need to own it. You need to admit to yourself that in order to have life improve that you need to make these changes. You might not be able to necessarily do it on your own. You may need to get help. You may need to go to a therapist. Obviously there's an ADHD coach. There are, if you have friends that know of your condition and are willing to help you, you can get their help, but you can't do nothing. Doing nothing isn't going to make anybody any happier and it's definitely going to make things way more difficult than they need to be. I recommend looking at Russell Barkley. He's got a number of videos on YouTube. He has a website of course. He's got uh, articles and his work on things like Attitude which is an ADHD website that has a lot of very helpful um, articles and links that you can go to, to to give you some advice and some help. 
He's really an amazing person. Um, I think he's probably the best psychologist or specialist when it comes to the study of ADHD and other, other issues that are also related to ADHD, but I think he's fantastic. Um, someday I'd like to get him on the show if, uh, you know, if things go well and talk to him and ask some really interesting questions for you guys. But I definitely recommend checking him out. Um, YouTube is a good place to start. I've heard from other people on Twitter who have ADHD as well that say he has the perfect voice and the perfect speed for people who have ADHD. I know that it's difficult, especially myself, to follow people because some people are too fast or too quiet or too like monotone to really be able to focus on. But Russell Barkley is an amazing person due to his how just how well he does his research and his theories are very well drawn out and he explains them really well if you want to start somewhere start with that um it's easy and if 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 you are seeing a therapist uh talk to that person to your therapist about him and get some information uh, the best way to, to learn is to research, even if it takes time, obviously. Research him. Talk about it with your therapist. Talk about him with your friends. Talk about him with your family. If you've got a significant other, talk about him with, with your partner. It's amazing what it can do. I spent most of my morning a couple days ago listening to one of his videos on emotional or sorry on executive function and the amount of information that I learned and that I was able to comprehend and that stuck in my head was really a lot compared to in the past because I tend to as I'm sure all of us do I tend to get distracted quite easily when I'm watching a video especially if the person who's talking in the video isn't very interesting or is has a hard time maintaining his audience i was able to do it i was able to sit there and i was able to you know block out uh, a lot of the other stuff that was going on and if there was a situation that required me to be distracted due to my work or something that had come up i paused and i was able to come back like i, I basically you could say i was hyper focused and thankfully it was a slow day and I didn't have to worry about too much, but it was super helpful. And the amount of stuff that I learned just from watching him was incredible. And it really helps me better understand this disability. And it taught me exactly what I need to do. And I just remember when the video was done, I grabbed all my notes, like I've got these sticky notes, uh, orange and blue and green and, and pink, and I was filling them out. I think I probably made at least a dozen, maybe more, I can't remember exactly. And I was sticking them all over the walls, all over the house. And I was putting them on doors and windows and in the bathroom. Some of them were motivational, some were just making reminders, some were telling me to breathe and to, and to slow down to stay sharp, to focus, you know, like things that you need to do in order to make it easier to live your day and have less ADHD symptoms come up. I have to say right now, I'm not on any medication. Um, my brain easily adapts to medication, so I've had a hard time finding the proper um, ADHD stimulation medication to make things work. I am considering going and starting a non-stimulant medication because the ability, instead of it creating more dopamine, it allows the brain to basically take in more dopamine. But there are all sorts of different methods that you can use besides the medication. I did discuss them in this podcast and I also discussed them in other podcasts uh, before this one. So to wrap this up, 
because we are getting to about an hour here, just realize that and be real with yourself. See your reality, pretending and faking it or not admitting to yourself, or if you want to put it another way, lying to yourself about this condition is not helpful whatsoever. The first thing you have to do in order to make any progress is you need to admit to yourself that this is an issue and that it is making your life difficult. If you can do that, then you are making a giant step towards having a better life and feeling less anxious and less, you know, consequences from ADHD. I've had quite a while to find out things, figure out what I'm doing, what I'm not doing, the mistakes that I'm making. And it takes a long time. And unfortunately it does, it has created a lot of frustration on both sides of the table on the neurotypical side being my girlfriend and the not or neurodivergent side, which was me. And we've had to learn together. And most of it is my learning on how to make my life easier. And instead of just saying, okay, I have ADHD and that's just the way it is, I'm being proactive and I'm owning this disability and I'm going out and doing what I can to adapt, to make it easier. I recommend you do the same. Talk to your therapist, see what they have to say. If you don't have a therapist, try and find one. Um, don't be shy about telling them. I know that it can be, it could be difficult, and I know that communication is not necessarily easy to do, especially to someone that you're not very familiar with. It does take some time to gain their trust, or for you to get for them to gain your trust. Excuse me, that's uh, the backwards thing, um, but it's important. Don't be afraid to seek out all the assistance that you can, but don't sit back and rely on it alone. You need to be proactive. You need to find ways to motivate yourself. And whether it's external, repetitive, routine, something that you can do as long as it's safe and ethically right and moral, then you're on the right path to getting better. Okay, everybody. Tomorrow is going to be an episode on CPTSD. I haven't exactly decided what it's going to be yet because I have a lot of really inform- a lot of interesting information that I've been gathering in the last few weeks. But I recommend you tune in and find out for yourself. All right, everybody, have a wonderful day. And for a lot of you, I will talk to you tomorrow. All right, bye, everybody.